Howdy, everybody. Uh, when I am not yelling at large groups of people, uh, my name is James Berg, and I'm a games user researcher at, researcher at Electronic Arts. Thank you for joining me for Dissecting the Dragon, Dragon Age uh, UX research and Dragon Age Inquisition. So let's talk about the next hour of your life. Uh, first off, uh, show of hands, uh, how many people here have played Dragon Age Inquisition? That's a lot of you. How many of you have gotten past the hinterlands? That is substantially fewer of you. And how many of you actually finished the game? <laughs> okay, I'm in trouble. All right, uh, how many people have played multiplayer? Okay, I'm gonna skip through that stuff in the interest of time then. All right, so um, fair warning, there are some mild spoilers. Um, you know, if you were a Bioware fan, I know you vastly outnumber me in giving you any big spoilers, would greatly decrease my odds of making it to the rest of GDC. Um, but there are some minor ones. So if you wanna completely avoid them, flee now. Um, also, I'm gonna try and talk through this really fast if there's lots of time for questions at the end. Um, that way there's less of me talking and more of you talking, which is a win for everybody. So I'm gonna finish up my intro. Uh, I'm gonna tell you about some of the challenges for this project, of which there were many. Uh, I'm gonna go through very briefly our testing methods because frankly, they're pretty standard, not very interesting. Um, and then spend some time on what we tested and when. So um, my name is James Berg. Uh, before being a researcher, I actually worked in QA. Um, not a recommended career path, by the way, for anyone watching this later. Um, please do go get your masters um, because doing this actually does require a lot of education and being smarter than I am. Um, once I got to being a researcher, I worked on projects like SSX, FIFA, NHL, um, UFC. Uh, you may notice a bit of a theme in what I've worked on. Um, pro tip, that theme is sports, not open world role playing games. Uh, fortunately, this is a fact that would not bite me in the butt uh, until our very first playtest. So my team is user experience research. Uh, we are led by Paul Newton and Veronica Zamito, uh, who I think many of you know. Um, we have three locations currently. We're also trying to start up a location in DICE. Um, please do check our job board because we're hiring everywhere. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. So uh, working with Bio was frankly really amazing. Um, this is a group that really understands the importance of UX uh, and the importance of listening to feedback from a variety of sources. Being able to get just kind of inserted into this as an additional point of feedback uh, was really easy, uh, and they made it really, really awesome to provide feedback and work as, as part of that team. Um, doing what we do requires buy-in from all levels of the organization. Uh, this is a partial job listing or job title listing uh, of the people I worked with. Um, so I worked with people right from you know beginner QA all the way up to uh, Aidan Scanlon, who is the assistant director of design, um, one of the foremost people in the company. Um, fun fact, I actually originally thought Aiden was a low-level producer because of how involved he was in playtesting. Then I actually looked at him up in our internal uh, kind of tool for seeing where people are in the organization, and I was very, very glad that I was always really nice to Aiden. Um, so I uh, got really, really good uh, buy-in from the team. So challenges for working on Inquisition. Um, one of the earliest conversations I had with Ryan Treadwell, uh, who's a development manager over at Bioware, um, he was telling me about the hinterlands. Um, and he was saying, you know, hey, yeah, this is gonna be you know, an exploration zone. It's gonna be about the size of Dragon Age 1 and 2 combined. And I was like, cool, that sounds like it's gonna be a really awesome game. And he's like, no, no, game, that, that's one exploration zone. It's like, oh, okay, all right, how many of those are there gonna be? 10. And as a gamer, I was like, wow, that's awesome. 10 zones, twice the size of the games. Oh God, I'm the researcher. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so my revelation was kind of like that series of tweets from Daniel Kazor. Uh, I don't know if you guys can actually read that, uh, but his last two ones are, for the first 15 to 30 uh, hours, you get the impression Dragon Age Inquisition is an extremely large game. Then it throws you a curveball and re reveals itself to be comically huge. Um, I know that better than pretty much anybody. So the way I tackled this was breaking things down into representative samples. Um, so we had kind of the prologue, which is, uh, you know, the game start area, the tutorials, kind of getting you up to speed. Then we had Haven, which is your first town. It's where you get introduced to crafting, companions. Uh, it's where you use the war table, which I'll talk more about later. Uh, then we have Skyhold, which replaces Haven. Um, there's your spoiler alert. Um, that is kind of your main base and your central hub. Um, then we have Hinterlands and Emerald Grades for exploration zones. Um, those are kind of both fairly large, a lot of play space for people to do various things. Um, and also uh, some different design goals within those areas. Halam Sherrill stepped in for our story-related content. Um, that's the Emerald, or uh, sorry, uh, the uh, Winter Palace. Um, that area is very heavy on role-playing and exploration, uh, pretty light on combat. Then we had some set-piece combat pieces 
Uh, the first one we tested was Red Lyrium Mine, which I'm not actually sure is even in the game anymore. Um, but uh, Bioware created some really specific tactical focused areas where they wanted you to have a very tactical combat experience, um, and it was a very structured design choice on their part. So that was the plan. Um, other challenges we had, uh, diversity was a big one. Um, for Bioware games, it was really important that A, we had a lot of women players come in, um, and B, we had members of the LGBTQ gamer community come in as well. Um, Bioware strives really hard to be very inclusive, uh, especially in their romance options. It's one of the big things that they're known for. Um, so when I was doing my recruiting, uh, you know, setting up the surveys and stuff for that, you know, asking for gender, okay, that's a pretty standard question. Then I came to, well, how do I make sure I get LGBTQ members uh, of the gaming community in without ending up as a really bad uh, headline on Kotaku. You know, EA discriminates against LGBTQ gamers. In truth, the reality would be opposite, um, but I, I just didn't know how to do that. So our very first playtest came around. I hadn't solved that problem. Uh, and then I looked at the data coming out of that playtest, which I'll tell you about a bit later. Um, and sure enough, a whole lot of LGBTQ people had showed up because they were just fans of the game. And I didn't actually need to make any special effort to recruit them. They just showed up anyway, like they were completely normal gamers, which is exactly what they were. So I spent a lot of time worrying about something that, fortunately, because of virus history, was not a problem. Um, if you want to solve that in your game, uh, I recommend having a long storied history of inclusion. Um, and that solves that really, really well. So we also had the problem that uh, Bioware fans tend to be passionate um, and very vocal and very active in the community. Um, so my uh, screeners for signups went globally viral three times. Um, that might sound like a really awesome problem to have uh, until you realize that you need a way of filtering out people who sign up from Poland or Czechoslovakia. Um, so we had to start having to add uh, a country uh, for signups. <laughs> Uh, instead of just city, which we normally do. Um, I don't know if it's too small to read there, uh, but you can also see one reply to that thread, uh, which is, yes, it finally pays off to live in Portland, just six hours away, what my luck. What your luck indeed, person from Portland, you are not driving six hours to come to my playtest because you were clearly crazy. <laughs> uh, and in case you're watching that, whoever wrote that, I really like you, please don't make me into a skin suit. Um, <laughs> So diversity uh, didn't just stop with the players, it also stopped with the choices that the game made you, or sorry, I uh, gave you. So for example, there's three classes, uh, two of which have subclasses. You can be a dual wield rogue, an archer rogue, a mage, a warrior with a sword and board shield, uh, or a two-handed warrior. Um, now this was really challenging because a lot of players that came to our games really wanted to play a female mage. That was their avatar, that was how they play role-playing games. Um, you know, I know exactly what my shepherd and what my femshep look like, and if you try and make me do anything else, I'm going to be upset. Uh, players coming to Dragon Age had the same kind of thing. So for sessions where, for example, mages just didn't work or had the ability to kill everything with a one-shot fireball, uh, and I couldn't take that away from them because of the stage the game was at, uh, I frequently had to lock them into certain options. So for a bunch of playtests, um, if you really wanted to be a human male dual-wielding rogue, great. Otherwise, sorry, I can't really help you. Um, Sometimes we had to limit that uh, and basically trade off between player agency, which is very important for a role-playing game, and testing goals. Uh, you know, if I need to test combat for dual-wielding rogues, well, I can't let you play a mage, even if you really, really, really want to. And no, if you ask me at the playtest, if you can switch that, I'm still going to tell you no. Um, once we got to multiplayer, there are 12 classes in multiplayer. They're all different. They're actually legitimately different classes. They're not just like slight variations. Um, and then there's four people on a team in multiplayer, which adds a whole lot of variations. Uh, I haven't done the math because I'm lazy, uh, but there's a lot of combinations between 12 people, or 12 classes and four people. Um, so that made that diversity really, really challenging too. Um, this may shock you, but please, people also play RPGs very, very differently. Um, when I drop you into a game of FIFA or NHL, I know pretty much exactly what you're gonna do. You're gonna try and put the puck into the net, or you're gonna try and smash guys into the boards. Those are your two options. I play the latter, uh, some people play the former. Um, when you drop you into an open world RPG, all bets are off. Um, a couple of good examples. Uh, one of the early play tests we had, I wanted people to come in to the prologue, they're gonna play through Haven, then they're going to the Hinterlands. Really good plan. Um, one play tester in particular uh, really felt that he wanted to explore mountains. He would just start running up the mountains because nobody had thought to block them off. There's literally nothing up there. Like, no content, was never going to be content, not even sure you were supposed to be able to get there. That's what he did for about three hours. <laughs> I wish I was kidding, but in retrospect, it does make a funny story. 
Um, he really liked the game, which was nice, uh, but he didn't actually play the game, so his data wasn't very helpful. Um, another test we did uh, was Skyhold, uh, which is kind of your main base. And for this test, uh, Bioware flew out two technical designers. Bioware frequently flew people out to our studio. Uh, I'm in Vancouver, which is Canada, just north of Seattle. Uh, and then Edmonton is just over the Rocky Mountains. Um, so they would fly people over. Uh, two technical designers came in, and uh, they basically wanted to see people come to Skyhold, uh, do some customization, access the vendors, do some crafting, leave, go to an exploration zone, come back, leave, go to an exploration, come back, maybe talk to a couple companions. Um, and then what happened was, I think about a third of our playtest group um, realized that they could talk to their companions, and that's all they did for three hours. Um, they had access to pretty much all the lines of dialogue because nobody had thought to lock those away yet that early in the project. Uh, and so that's what they did. They sat and chatted with Cassandra and then everybody else for a really long time. Um, so I learned that if you want people to play your game, aka what you are testing, what you need to test, um, you really need to hammer that home um, and really need to direct your surveys or walk around with the stick and poke people like I did um, to try and get them on task. Um, if you just let them play their game, for some crazy reason, they're just gonna play the game they want to. Very, very unhelpful. Um, so working uh, with Frostbite 3, uh, it was a new engine for most of the team. Uh, well, maybe not most of the team, but a substantial portion of the team. Um, really extremely powerful. We got the game stood up really, really early. It looks amazing if you've played it on a PC um, or on a next-gen console. Uh, Gen 3 still looks okay, thanks to Frostbite. Um, but it is really, really powerful, but with that power becomes uh, some costs. One of those costs was things would break. You know, people are using a new engine. Um, it's got a lot of features to it. They were trying to add a whole lot, build an entire game world. Things would just break throughout the course of the project. Um, we also had a lot of blue sky. So the team had a lot of time to iterate. I started testing, I think, two and a half years before it launched. So we had a really long window. Um, we were testing multiplayer like a year before it was even released, or sorry, a year before it was even announced. Um, so the team had a lot of time to iterate and get things right. Um, the downside to that was the team wanted to iterate a lot and get things right. Um, there's only so many hours in the day, uh, and you've only got so many days in the year to actually do playtesting. Um, so it was challenging trying to balance, okay, this is an iteration of something we've already tested versus I need to test an entirely new zone or an entirely new feature. And because the game was so huge, I knew I couldn't test everything. Um, so for this kind of project, you need to be really, really selective and picky with what you're actually looking at. Also, uh, this is the third game in a franchise. So it was really important to the team that fans of Dragon Age 1 and fans of Dragon Age 2, uh, and those are frequently very disparate and argumentative camps, um, both enjoyed the third game. Um, and then we've got the new Skyrim generation, uh, which if you've never played an RPG before, would, you know, 10 years ago have shoved you into a locker for telling, you, for telling them that they would have played an RPG, um, and who now really like this kind of game. Um, they wanted to try and see if we could bring that market in too. Um, so it was always a very difficult balancing act of trying to make sure the people we brought in and the feedback we were getting, weighing it against these demographics. So um, Tom, I mentioned before, we had a lot of it. Um, one of the really interesting things about this project, uh, interesting things about this project, uh, was that early on, you can kind of get a grasp of everything that's kind of going on, because it's a fairly small, massively unwieldy project. As things got bigger and bigger and bigger, you just, or I just completely lost the ability to understand what the heck was going on where. The game was just too big for any one person to follow it um, at the level of detail that I needed to actually do research. So I relied really heavily on the team to know what their areas were doing, and then I would just kind of interface with a dozen different people throughout the project to make sure that I knew what was going on. That way we could plan testing, plan, you know, do help them with sprint planning, figure out what we should be doing long term. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, when things break in an RPG, um, it's really, really hard. Um, you know, if one small thing breaks, the add-on and kind of the, the cascade of effects that can have uh, can really derail a playtesting session really fast. And because things are so big and so complicated, I couldn't always rely on QA to know about all those problems. Um, you know, if I was gonna be testing two major large exploration zones, plus some combat stuff and whatever, um, you know, virus QA is really world-class, um, but even they have limits. So, story. Um, I love the Dragon Age stories. Um, I'm a bit of a lore buff, not nearly as much as some of our players or maybe some of you. Um, 
but I know my Luvians and, and some of the Elven Gods and all this kind of stuff. Um, players that were coming from Skyrim or that hadn't played the first game or the second game had no idea what the heck was going on in this world. So Dragon Age Inquisition starts uh, where you've got the mages and the Templars. They're fighting. Uh, the Chantry, which is kind of the central organized religion, is trying to broker a peace. Um, so they've got their person named Divine Justinia who calls a conclave. The conclave then blows up. That is considered a suboptimal presentation of a peace negotiation. And you are found at the wreckage with this glowing green thing on your hand that has something to do with everything blowing up. You are then interrogated by Cassandra. If you've played Dragon Age 2, you know this is not a good position to be in. Um, now, if you've played Dragon Age 1 and Dragon Age 2, you kind of understand the lore and the background for what's going on. If you haven't played those games, you just have no idea. You know, you wake up in a jail cell, some mean lady's yelling at you, you've got this green glowing thing, people are talking about the Chantry and Justinia and the mages, and oh god, what's going on? Um, so it was really challenging early on in the project trying to decide how much information to give the players. Because if I gave them too much information, if I just kind of explained everything for them, then that was going to be more information than the Dragon Age Inquisition final game was going to give them. Uh, if I did that, then that would hide the problem of, hey guys, players have no idea what's going on in the start of your game. If I gave them too much information, then I was creating that problem. Um, so I took this problem to Aiden Scanlon, who's like number three in command of Bioware, and went, I have this problem. Is there someone who can fix it? And he actually wrote something for me. It was like, this is what we intend to give players. And I was like, thank you, survey. Okay, we'll go with that. Um, that worked pretty well, um, but even still towards later iterations, once things still got into the game, um, I think we still overestimated the amount that we were going to be able to kind of count on players figuring things out. Um, or even wanting to figure things out. Um, you know, this was mentioned in one of the earlier talks today where, uh, you know, Bill Gardner's talk, if you saw that, where they were really kind of banking on the whole idea of the mystery between, you know, in Inquisition, you wake up, you have no memory, there's this explosion, what's going on? That's really exciting from a writer's point of view. From a player's point of view, they're like, hey, where's some stuff I can hit with a sword? Um, so engaging people that way can be really, really challenging if you have a story-based game. So this was my very favorite play test of the entire play cycle. Um, this was a one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, eye-tracking usability play test uh, where we were looking at the inventory and the crafting screens. Uh, what you see there, the red lines, if you haven't used eye-tracking before, uh, is a gaze path. Um, the larger, uh, larger circles um, are areas of fixation. The larger the circle, the longer players looking at it. Now this is the crafting screen. Um, I'm gonna give you a second to guess what really important piece of information nobody's looking at. I'm hoping most of you guessed the damage. Um, so what happened here was I would give people the task of, I want you to create the most powerful two-handed ax for your warrior companion you possibly can. In the game, uh, you went to craft this item uh, once they got to that point, uh, and then they started picking the material for the head of their ax. Now when they changed the material, the color of the ax had changed. This immediately and irrevocably overrode all possible considerations that they had and they immediately just wanted to find an axe head that looked cool, okay? Guys wanted black, a lot of girls wanted pink, okay? That's just the results. I'm not, not trying to make any kind of statement about gender here. That's just what the data told me. Um, so overwhelmingly, people would be like, oh my God, okay, I found this. Click, craft, this is amazing, my axe is so pretty. Meanwhile, James is making notes. Player crafted the worst possible crap. X possible, dwarves are crying. Um, but they were really happy with their new terribly crappy weapon. Um, so what the team did to fix this uh, is that now in the final game, when you go to the crafting screen, uh, you can see the top screenshot there, uh, there's a DPS range. That is kind of our beginning breadcrumb clue that, hey, your choices here can affect the quality of your weapon. And then when you select uh, the first material type, there's this really bright, big orange text. It's like 209 DPS. Please, please pay attention to me. And then every time you change the material, that green text goes away and comes back. And they're like, Please, please still pay attention to me. I know your axe is pretty, but please, this is also important. Um, so it was a lot of fun finding that data, uh, and hopefully we fixed that problem. So uh, Dragon Age is also a very, very complicated game. Uh, it's a deep RPG. There's got a really good advanced combat system, um, which for players new to the game is absolutely terrifying. Um, this, for example, is our tactics screen. Um, here you have a list of abilities. You can choose to set them to uh, never get used by your companions, uh, get used sometimes, or get used uh, preferentially. Uh, and then you can also map them. Then there's descriptions of things, and there's just a lot going on on this screen. 
Uh, for areas where we needed to test later on, say I wanted to drop someone into a, a dragon fight, you know, a level eight dragon fight, um, I couldn't always take the time to have them play through the hour or two for the tutorial to actually learn how to play the game. We just needed to kind of drop you in and say, go. Um, or even for exploration areas where combat wasn't a focus. So I didn't really care if you died a whole lot. Uh, as long as you're kind of exploring and give me focus on that stuff. I'm sorry, feedback on that stuff. Um, but players still found uh, the overall quality of their experience was substantially lower when they started going into the screens and realizing how much depth there was um, and just how much they didn't understand. So as long as players can understand this stuff, it was a really big positive. So players that had played Dragon Age 1 and 2 looked at this stuff and went, wow, okay, they've actually expanded this, this is really cool. The players that hadn't looked at this and went, wow, there's a whole lot of stuff that, isn't, that I don't understand here. You're making me feel dumb. I don't like this game as much. Um, so takeaway I took from that is, you know, for doing playtesting, if you can't kind of bring people up through that natural learning curve or learning cliff in some cases, I'm looking at you, Riot, um, you know, dropping people in and then just kind of expecting them to, to figure all this out uh, is really, really challenging. Um, and you have to be really careful about what feedback you pull out of that so that you can separate between usability and your learning cliff. Uh, so on the right there, you can see the war table. Uh, for those that haven't played the game, the war table uh, is kind of your one-stop shop for unlocking new areas. There is also some mini-game stuff that isn't really important for this, um, but basically if you cannot use the war table, you cannot play the game. It's just that simple. Um, so it was really, really important early on um, for players to, to understand how to use this. Um, and part of the process we went through uh, before tutorialization came in um, was I basically started trying to explain it to players and then refined that explanation over time as players still got confused, pardon me, and had to throw up their hands for help. Um, so eventually I got to a fairly good explanation for how to use this thing, which we then fed back into the tutorials when they started actually getting implemented. All right, so originally we were gonna have a Q&A session partway through, but to spare the Sony guys trying to run around with mics, we'll do that at the end. So uh, my testing methods here uh, were, as I mentioned, pretty unexciting. Um, I used, did one usability test uh, with the eye tracking. Pretty much everything else was group play tests. Um, our lab here, uh, which is actually getting a retrofit soon, um, seats 18 people. Um, so I basically tried to cram as many people into our lab as possible. Um, you know, the, as I mentioned before, there's so many variation in how people play this game. I just wanted to get as many people as possible to try and reduce the overall randomness of that variation in the data. Uh, so we try and get 18 people in at a time. For Dragon Age multiplayer, it's a four-player co-op mode, so we'd have groups of four. So I'd basically cram in 16 people in, uh, and then several times I actually flew out over to the lab in Edmonton, uh, which they built partway through the, the cycle, um, and let me use that, uh, and I was able to run eight people at a time over there. Only other thing about their testing approach that's really interesting, um, mostly because this is, lets me tell a, a kind of a lame joke, um, is uh, I tested basically everything when it was playable, not when it was complete. Um, that's just, you know, and the nature of a big budget game, you can't wait until something is complete to get feedback, otherwise it's too late to make changes. Or if it's not too late, it's at least really frickin' expensive and nobody likes you anymore. Um, so one of my favorite parts uh, about testing this, this kind of theory, um, was that for a long while, uh, Solus, uh, who is uh, an elven mage in the game, for quite a while uh, had Microsoft text-to-speech as, uh, as his voice. Um, now players just don't even realize that this is a thing. Right? They just assume that the voices in the game is the voice acting. So people were complaining about it all the time, like, hey, this guy sounds like a robot. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I guess he does. Um, so I can just kind of put that aside. What I really liked, though, was a couple people were like, man, I really love the voice acting for Solus. It fits his character so well. Um, and I took a good, long, hard look at the data, said, okay, there's not enough of you to be representative. I don't need to pass that on to the writers because they know when I'm going to be at their studio next. Um, so, uh, the testing approach I took, uh, kind of what and when. Early on, uh, we looked at concept art, ideas, and themes, pretty standard stuff. Uh, we did our combat and exploration first looks. Um, like I said, Frostbite 3, really powerful. We got stood up really, really early. Uh, we did our control and HUD first looks. Uh, we looked at multiplayer pretty much through the entire course of the project. Um, and we also did some Dragon Age Keep stuff. Once we got into core production, iterating on controls in the HUD was really, really important to the team. Uh, I'll tell you more about that later. Um, game flows, we started looking at kind of those cycles um, and how people progressed through the game. Uh, we did full gameplay testing, started mixing all the elements instead of you know, just looking at exploration, just looking at combat. We started trying to look at things in groups. 
Uh, so that was when we started to look at combat, exploration, story, and systems, and then multiplayer all the way through. Uh, late production, uh, we kind of did the final passes on the HUD. Uh, we looked at balancing, particularly the early game areas. Um, multiplayer, uh, there are some web tools that got built late uh, in the cycle, and we kind of started looking at those, or look, looked at those and got them in. Um, and then the tutorials came in late, and pretty much as soon as those came in, I did nothing else but look at tutorials. So um, my very first playtest, uh, I mentioned that my vast amount of experience with open world RPGs um, that didn't exist uh, kind of bit me about the first playtest. Um, so uh, how do I put this delicately? Um, I bit off way more than I can chew. Um, I'm a big guy, I can chew a lot, um, but this is what I was looking at. So they wanted to do some concept art and uh, crafting, of course, that's important. In exploration, uh, Crestwood was up, so sure, let's try that. Uh, also the set piece combat in Red Larian Mines. And uh, there's this other exploration area called the Dales that I've team figured we should take a look at that. So I was like, okay, that sounds good. Um, oh, and story is also important, so we're gonna look at Halamshra. Uh The time allocated for that playtest was eight hours. Um, I am well known for uh, wily and cunning plans. Uh, this was not one of them. Um, I think maybe that would have been good. Um, we did manage to pull it off, uh, but I do not recommend that. So this was in the very first playtest we did. Um, this is early concept art uh, for all of your companions plus the Inquisitor. Um, for those of you that have played the game, you can probably figure out who it is. Maybe, I hope so. Um, so what we did here was we asked people who they thought these characters were um, to tell us a little bit about them um, and also to tell us who they would play and who they wanted to romance. Um, I was really surprised by the passion of some of the responses, just from you know, a single static image you know, with, from a lineup. This is basically you know, a mugshot lineup of a bunch of characters, uh, and players really inferred a lot just from the art um, and really kind of developed good, strong bonds with characters they'd only ever seen you know, this single picture of. Um, you know, obviously, occasional, you know, some people recognize Varric and Cassandra, and they're like, yay, they're back, um, but a lot of the characters there are completely new. Um, this is also the playtest where I realized that, oh, okay, a whole bunch of our women are selecting women as romance options, and some of our guys are selecting guys. Um, thank you, LGBTQ community. You are awesome. So in that very first playtest, oops, we also looked uh, at some enemy types. Uh, so this was uh, more of a literal mugshot line. Um, so this was the Venatori faction that's in the game. Uh, we showed this to people, uh, asked them, you know, kind of what they thought this, the enemy's name would be, uh, what they thought they would do, and then to give us a stack rank for which they liked best. Kind of a vague, fuzzy thing, but I thought it worked. Then they got to play the game, uh, and then give us the same kind of feedback afterwards. So poor Mr. Green Door there, um, he's got a tower shield that is untextured. Um, nobody liked him at the beginning, uh, because he's got a giant green untextured shield. Uh, nobody liked him after, because he's got a giant shield that is actually really tactically effective, uh, and also it looks like a giant green barn door. Um, now, the Brute, one F there, the, the big guy on the right, had a different problem. At the beginning, people really, really liked him. He's big, he's intimidating, he looks awesome. Um, he's got a great big untextured axe, which didn't really seem to matter, um, given how awesome the rest of him look. Uh, the post analysis, however, he dropped way down. Um, the problem for this was basically that he had two keyframe animations, okay? Keyframe one was this. Keyframe two was this. In between those two animations, you died. <laughs> so, uh, ready for testing being playable, not complete, sometimes. Methodology amended. Um, the uh, other issue we had with this uh, was the guy in the middle, uh, 1D, and the guy at the end, 1G. Um, people thought the guy on the end, 1G, uh, they're both wizards, they're both spellcasters, they thought the guy in the end what is this, a spear. So when he started throwing around fire mines and fireballs and stuff like that, people were like, what the heck, why is this guy with a spear blowing the crap out of me with magic? So again, the art you choose uh, can have a really big impact on the perception. So, um, a, as far as I know, never before re revealed factoid about Dragon Age, and I went through extensive uh, vetting with the Bioware team to make sure it was okay that I talk about this, uh, is that early on in Inquisition, you couldn't actually get off the ground. Um, so you were locked to the ground like Dragon Age 1 and Dragon Age 2. Now, with the exploration focus for the team, they knew that they wanted to change this. Okay? They knew it was an important pillar of their game for exploration. They wanted to make this better. They weren't sure exactly how to do that and what function this would take. 
So early on, uh, well, no, early production at least, um, we looked at a mantling mechanic similar to Assassin's Creed. Uh, so basically, uh, I did a play test. They implemented a mantling uh, mechanic where you can climb things. Did a play test to see what people thought they should be able to climb. Some people thought they could climb stuff that's you know, above neck height. As long as they can kind of get their fingers up, they can climb it. Other people figured, oh, if I can get my shoulders up like this, I can climb it. Others figured anything that's waist high, they could climb. Uh, but it also created the really weird problem of if something is this high, they can climb it. If something is ankle high, they can't. You know, so you've got to stick on the ground or a rock. You can't get over that because there's no mantling animation, and you're otherwise locked to the ground. Um, so what they eventually implemented uh, was the jump system, of course, which is in the final game. Then later on, they added mounts. Then mounts were able to jump. Um, and I really do not envy the world designers that had to go back and be like, well, I planned for them to be stuck on the ground here, and all of a sudden, they're on horses that can jump. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, so the player reaction to the, the mantling system was pretty good, um, but it was also people got very easily confused with it. Um, so I really admire what the Assassin's Creed team uh, for Ubisoft have done in making that pretty intuitive, because that's hard, surprisingly hard. Um, so now that I've praised Ubisoft, uh, I'm now going to apologize to anyone who worked on Skyrim. Um, so early on, uh, the Dragon Age Inquisition team used the Skyrim-style compass map, um, and this tested really, really poorly. Um, like bottom barrel poorly for, for people trying to use it. Um, what happens here is you've got a 180 degree field of view that's replicated on that map, but you can move your character in one direction, your camera in another direction, and people had a heck of a time figuring out which one the map was tracking. Um, it also has an issue where if something is behind you, you actually have to physically turn around. Um, this is kind of an awkward way to do things. Um, and then there's also the issue of distance. If something is really far away, you can try and make it a small icon, which then makes it really hard to read. Um, or you can make it a big icon, which makes it easier. It takes up a lot of space on that tiny, tiny little thing. Um, so what the team ended up doing was, after a bunch of, of poor testing results and feedback from within the team, they ditched that and brought in a radar, which you can see in the bottom left there if you haven't played the game. Um, now, the radar has pretty much the same kind of functionality where you know, things that are off to the side kind of appear along the edges of it. Um, but at least it's 360 degrees, and you can tell when there's something close by. This still had a fairly big problem in that people thought it was a minimap. So everyone, ex well, not everyone, but a lot of players expected this was a minimap. So I frequently got really negative comments about it because they'd be inside, they'd be trying to figure out where they were going, um, and they just weren't able to do that using their minimap because it was broken when it was actually just never designed to do that. Um, it was a radar. But of course, players haven't seen the previous version, so they're not like, thank you, this is better. They're just, hey, this doesn't work as well as I wanted to, this sucks. So um, Inquisition is, of course, a role-playing game, which means talking, talking to people is very important. Um, now, this line here, uh, this is selected from the dialogue wheel, which is how you interact with basically everybody for a conversation. Uh, this line is, it's fine. That can be delivered as, it's fine. Nice, happy. It can also be delivered as, it's fine. To anyone that's married, you know the difference. <laughs> um, players, however, if all you have there is text saying, it's fine, it could be either one of those. Um, and it is a really, really nasty, like, load your last save kind of problem if you think you're going to say something and you say something completely different, OK? Um, so Bioware added uh, kind of this tone icon uh, into, uh, into kind of the center to give you an idea of, like, OK, arms crossed. This is probably going to come out as being you know, fairly stern and uncompromising. Um, this tested extremely well. Um, so anybody else that's making games, please steal this because it works really well. It's a really good user experience. Um, but do test your icons, because some of them had some issues with being uh, ambiguous. So as long as you have clear icons, this worked really, really well. So multiplayer, I'm going to have time to talk about it a little bit. Um, so multiplayer, the, the early on, they were really looking just to find the fun. Um, they had three classes available early on, the Legionnaire, the Archer, and the Keeper. Uh, the Legionnaire is your tank class. It works by uh, using abilities to create guard. Guard acts as kind of an, an extra health bar on top. Um, your archer is kind of your ranged DPS. Your keeper is your uh, replacement healer uh, who creates a barrier which absorbs damage. Um, even, pardon me, even just with these three classes, the variations between four uh, players playing them was quite a bit. Um, what we found was that if you had a good, good legionnaire player in your team, you were good to go. If you did not, you got murdered. Um, no ifs, ands, or buts. Uh, if your tank sucked, you just died. You went in with two archers, two keepers, you died. Um, I took this back as a problem to the team, saying, hey, guys, you know, people really need the keep, or people really need the Legionnaire to be successful. 
And they went, perfect, that's exactly what our design goal was. Um, so that was really good because you know, we basically had tested, had what I considered a UX failure, um, but it was actually meeting the design goal for the team um, because that was the experience they wanted to create. They want you to go in uh, to this dungeon crawl uh, and do this uh, kind of experience as part of a, a balanced team. Um, so this is the Dragon Age Keep. Um, Veronica Zamito, our research lead, my boss, um, tested this uh, for the, the Dragon Age team. Um, this is basically the way they did an end run around the problem of importing your game saves. So here uh, you can make all the decisions, or not all, but most of the decisions for Dragon Age 1 and 2, uh, import your game save data, uh, and that way you've got the world exactly the way you like it. Um, believe me, I've heard from many people since the game launched um, that accidentally did not get this right or there was a bug uh, and they didn't get this imported properly. It makes a huge difference to the experience of the user. Um, so this was really important that they got it right. So Veronica did a bunch of really good testing for these guys uh, in order to make sure it was usable. So control schemes, um, this is showing uh, just how complicated the game controls are. Um, one of those columns there uh, is the single player, one is in the tactical cam view, and one is in the multiplayer. This is not the final controls, but this is the first time the, the single player and the multiplayer controls had been unified, um, had really kind of gelled into just about their final form. Um, we did a lot of iterative testing. Um, you'll see some of that on the UI. Um, you can see how some of the buttons moved. Uh, on the very first screen there, you can see the, the Y callout and the B, uh, and then all of a sudden they're different. Um, the UI got tested a whole lot. We did a lot of iteration on the HUD. Um, fun fact, every time you make a game uh, mechanics change, you also have to change your, your UI. Uh, if you don't do that, players get really, really confused. Um, so now it's time for our pop quiz. Um, I did, of course, warn you that there'd be a test, right? Okay. Um, so I'm going to give you the same test I gave players. I want you to show, I'm going to show you a screenshot. Um, and what I told players was, hey, your party has basically just finished up a fight in a cave with a bunch of spiders. I want you to tell me everything you know about your party's status. Okay, go. Okay, so show of hands. Um, how many people here think, uh, my question's pretty easy. Okay, a bunch of UX professionals, you guys ought to get this. Um, no pressure. Okay, so show of hands, how many people think none of your characters were critically injured? Okay, how many people think one of your characters was critically injured? How many people, two, three, and everybody? Okay, correct answer, one. Uh, so the third person down, Iron Bull, um, is just about dead. The problem is, is his health bar, which is green, is completely obscured uh, by the guard bar, which is the giant silver thing. You can see in the final version the difference that some UI revisions and a lot of feedback made. Uh, Cassandra there, second down from the top. You can see the, the barrier at the top, then you've got the guard, then you've got the giant red text box, or giant red health bar, uh, and you've also got the very different character icon. You know, she looks like she's had the crap kicked out of her, uh, which is exactly what's happened. So prior to this, uh, and especially in multiplayer, people would get a bunch of guard or get some barrier, be at really, really low health, not heal themselves, the barrier or the guard would get worn away, and all of a sudden they'd be dead. And they'd just be like, what the heck happened? That thing just one-shotted me from full health. So don't feel bad that you didn't get it, because a whole lot of players didn't either. So once we got into core testing, um, we started looking at the flow of the game. Uh, you can see there on the left, that is the Dragon Age official uh, Twitter making fun of itself uh, for her players not getting out of the hinterlands. Um, we started looking at kind of that flows. Uh, you can see there on the right, that's Mike Laidlaw and Cameron Lee uh, doing a uh, Twitch stream showing off the uh, early tutorials for the uh, war table. Um, during core, we did a lot of testing about how the flow of the game went. Um, I wish I had more time to tell you guys about it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip through that quick. Um, so combat, uh, kind of three pillars of combat that we tested. First uh, was healing. So there is no traditional healing, or almost no traditional healing in this game. Normally when you come to a sword and sorcerer RPG, you've got your, you know, your black mage, your white mage, your fighters, your rogues. That's kind of the standard expectation. Dragon Age doesn't have that. Dragon Age, instead of healing, you're supposed to mitigate damage using guard and barrier as your mitigation stuff. Um, and then when that doesn't work, you also have potions. You have a limited supply of them though, which creates a really interesting exploration dynamic where you need to go back to base to resupply. You are not just an endlessly refueling, killing machine. Um, you actually need to go back and restock on potions, otherwise you're risking getting caught into a tough fight and you can't heal yourself. Um, so testing and getting people to realize that that was even in existence was really challenging. Um, especially early on, I got a lot of feedback like, how do I heal? Where's the healing? When do I get access to the healing spell? Um, there is a single healing spell in the game, uh, but it's on a limit break mechanic. 
and you only get it until quite late in the game. So a lot of people were really bitterly complaining because they couldn't heal themselves because they just didn't understand how that mechanic worked, uh, how that kind of design worked. So it's, if you're gonna do something like that that breaks the mold, it's really important to slow down, explain that to the players so that they don't feel lost and don't feel confused. Second thing I wanna talk about uh, is the tactical camera. Um, this is an extremely in-depth mode. Um, you can see there in the center of the interface for it. Uh, it's very different from the standard controls. Um, and it was really, really challenging to test and to get people to use. Um, we did some testing with this uh, basically to try and work out the tutorials uh, and try and how to explain it to people uh, and then trying to test it for actually being used. What we found was some people, uh, about maybe 20% of people, preferred fighting this way all the time. Uh, it was a pause and play mode. You can do all the fighting like this because it's extremely precise controls. A lot of people just prefer to button mash when they can and they'd switch to this when they absolutely had to. Um, this allows you to, to pause time, give commands to people, be super, super tactical. Uh, for testing this, though, it was really difficult trying to figure out uh, where the game would be, where the fights would be challenging enough for them to want to use it um, instead of feeling forced to use it, um, or the game not being hard enough and they just don't use it at all. Um, there's also kind of the, a very contrasting difference between players that only want to control one character, their Inquisitor, and players that want to control all four characters. So if you want to control all four characters, odds are much more good. You correlate to the group that uses the tactical uh, camera as well. Um, but I really had to pay a lot of attention to the feedback for combat especially, um, because the experience of people that just use one character, um, depending on what their character was, if they were their tank, they had a good tank, hopefully, if they didn't suck at the game. Um, you know, if they had a DPS, they had really good DPS. If they had a mage, you know, they could reliably barrier their tank. Um, so I really had to watch the AI and figure out okay, is this player controlling one of their characters or are they switching all four to fill all these roles? Um, and as the AI got better and better, that became less important. But early on, that was a huge differentiator. So multiplayer, uh, in just a time, I'm just gonna skip through quick. Um, 12 classes, very, very complicated uh, to test. Um, we never tested everything at once until the very end when people still had to unlock them. Um, and then there's three different uh, zones. And then there's a bunch of different emery types as well. So multiplayer, we did a lot of testing. I wish I had time to tell you guys about it. So uh, late in the process, um, I really, really felt it was important to test the world state import functionality. Um, I banged on the drum uh, for this one a lot uh, because I knew how important it was going to be to the team or to, uh, to the players, uh, and the team completely agreed. Um, so when you start Dragon Age Inquisition, it is completely impossible to miss this flow. It is just built right into new game. Um, if you don't know uh, what the uh, Dragon Age Keep is, it tries to kind of explain it to you. It also gives you the web address several times. So if you don't know what it is, you haven't heard of this before the game launches, hopefully you see this and go, okay, do I want to import my world state Dragon Age Keep? What the heck is that? Go to your phone or your browser or whatever. Look at it, figure out what it is, then go, oh, okay, this is how I get my, my save game in. Um, you can see on the bottom there, if you choose to take the default world state, um, it then prompts you again. You know, like, are you sure? Really? 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 So you really have to, to work at, at not noticing that. Um, still, some players, if you don't understand what it's asking you, it can be still confusing. One of the light things we tested also was uh, Dragon Age HQ. Um, and this is kind of a multiplayer, uh, multiplayer add-on um, where you can kind of show off uh, your multiplayer characters to your friends. Um, it's kind of a, a social thing. Uh, pretty cool thing. Uh, if you haven't checked it out and you play multiplayer, take a look. Um, so. Uh, we've got the tutorials. So I'm going to tell you, oh, Omid, you lied to me. I'm going top left. Oh, there we go. He didn't lie, I'm just dumb. You, where'd my cursor go? Nope, help. Can you tell him I'm a PC guy? Um, so the tutorial for this, uh, what I'm gonna show you here, um, or what Omid is gonna show you, um, is the, uh, the very first combat tutorial. Now in the game, you press right trigger to attack. Um, actually, you know, before we show this, let's see what the audience does. So you press right trigger to attack, okay? How many people that play the game know that? Okay, that really should be all of you. Um, now what you may not know is you can press and hold the right trigger to continuously attack. How many of you didn't know that? Nobody ever going to admit it, or you're just way better than all of our participants? All right, one brave soul, Daniel, thank you. Yes, so this is the tutorial, uh, and this will kind of explain, hopefully, why players, that's not it, there we go. This will hopefully explain why players had some trouble. Thank you. I'm 
So what happened here is you see press right trigger to attack. Great, you do that. And then you're paying attention to the attacking. And then the demon runs away. So you're paying attention to the demon running away. And you're like, no, no demon, you don't run away. I want to stab you now. So now you have to follow the character, uh, press right trigger to attack, um, and read the command prompt all at the same time. Um, that's a little bit much to ask of, of our participants. Um, so I think that was kind of one, uh, one area that we failed um, was because you know, three hours into a playtest, I would still frequently hear you know, pretty much half the room sitting there spamming that right trigger. And then I start getting complaints a couple hours in of like, man, you know, I like the combat, but my finger's tired. So if you didn't know before, you can just press and hold. All good? All right. Um, so multiplayer, uh, late game, we really just focused on testing kind of the full flow. Um, so you get into a match, you go through the match, you get rewarded, you come back out, you spend the rewards, you craft some stuff, uh, you level up your character, you go back in. Um, wish you had more time to talk about it because it is awesome. All right, so uh, late game, we did balancing. Um, this was primarily focused on kind of the uh, early, early game to make sure that that was a good experience. And if you've played the Hinterlands, uh, you, in fact, know that the Hinterlands are not ruled by a dragon. They are ruled by a very powerful family of bears. Um, bears were kind of the, the uber monster for the Hinterlands, which is kind of the bulk of the early experience. Um, bears uh, in most games are kind of like, hey, it's a bear, that's cute. Uh, in this game, they are Yogi on steroids, uh, and you were carrying their picnic basket. Um, so what happened here was players uh, would kind of run around, they'd see a bear, and they'd be like, oh, cool, that's an animal, I can take that. Oh, God, I died. Then they'd come back, and they'd be like, all right, I'm going to get that bear, and then they'd die. Uh, and then they'd be like, okay, now I'm going to go into tactical view, I'm going to really double down, I'm going to use six potions, and that bear is going down. Um, I saw people put more preparation, I, I swear I'm not exaggerating this for comedic effect, more preparation into bear fights than the dragon fight that they ran into later. Dragon fight, they're like, charge, I'm going to get that dragon. Bear fights, they're like, all right, tactical mode. Cassandra, you get up front, all right, let's get this going. Um, pro tip, also, when you're playing the game, if you haven't, don't make the Drufalo angry. Um, they are what bears are afraid of. So, as promised, I talked fast so that I could get a little bit more Q&A time in. I'm going to shut up now until you guys have questions. How do you guys handle... So do we have, sorry, do we have Sony guys with mics? You guys are awesome. Thank you. How did you guys structure testing all of the, the different behaviors around different... Uh, well, different player types and how that would map to different um, characters they would select. Okay, uh, really good question um, that I wish I had a really good answer to. Um, kind of the first thing I need to do is realize that those existed and figure out kind of what those looked like. Um, you know, there's really no existing body of research that I'm aware of that tells you this is how players are going to play these kinds of games. Um, I looked for it, my Google Foo was too weak, I couldn't find it, so I had to kind of figure it out myself. Um, the biggest way I tackled this was by getting as many people in to test things as I could. Um, you know, if you get enough data, those kind of things kind of level themselves out. Um, but I really had to give people the chance to kind of tell me what their play style was, um, and then kind of try and bucket that as we went through. So for the playtest, especially where people were like, hey, I really like playing, you know, mages, and I was forcing them to play a rogue, I really need to pay a lot of attention to that. Um, and then when I was looking at the combat-focused uh, stuff, especially, um, I noticed a lot of differences uh, between players that really liked playing a very heavy tactical game, um, in like Dragon Age 1, and then kind of a more action-oriented RPG like Dragon Age 2 or Kingdoms of Amalur or Skyrim even. Um, does that answer that question? Do you find yourself personas or...? Um, so, so Bioware does actually use personas. Um, they didn't really map really strongly to that detailed of a gameplay behavior. Um, so I didn't really get that detailed with the analysis, um, more just kind of making general observations. Um, and because we didn't have instrumented metrics, I couldn't tell for sure what kind of what the uh, expected impact of these are or what the actual measured impact of these were. Um, pardon me. And I didn't want to give the team bad data. So basically, I tried to keep it kind of high level, get as much detail as I could where I could. Um, and sometimes there were large enough differences that there was a very obvious effect. Um, but basically, just kind of did the best we could. Uh, there's so many variations that it, it's hard to narrow down which is really impacting it. Devin. So a big part of Dragon Age is, is talking to the various companions. Did, did you do much research into the way people were feeling about the emotional connection they had to companions? So if a 
example, this game has a lot more rejection from characters in the previous games. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, try talking to Josephine, or not Josephine, uh, Vivienne sometime. Um, yeah, she's not particularly nice about her rejections. Um, so uh, I wish we could have done more of it. Um, a big difficulty uh, was that apparently I'm not allowed to chain people to desks for multiple days at a time. Um, that's against some kind of EA policy that I think is ridiculous. Um, so really developing that kind of emotional connection was really hard. Um, early on in the game, um, I was able to get some really good feedback uh, about Liliana and Cassandra, because they were present in the beginning of the game. Um, and then you meet Varric, and everyone's like, yay, Varric. Um, well, pretty much everyone is yay, Varric. Um, so I, I wish I could have done more of it. Unfortunately, uh, we just didn't have the, the breadth of time. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to look at how people are talking about it now that the game's been out. Um, I just haven't had, haven't had the opportunity to do that research. Adams? So, uh, oh, sorry. So, uh, fairly early on, you guys had a patch that changed a bunch of UI features. Uh, I'm thinking of the search function and the map, particularly. Uh, yes. So was that something that you had sort of had queued up before the game released, or was that something that came as a result of user feedback post-release? Um, a little bit of both. Um, so, uh, Liz uh, knew that the search function uh, could use some work. Um, we kind of found that uh, throughout the course of the feedback, uh, originally the search radius was actually uh, a, I think like a 60 degree, 60 degree cone. Um, and that just basically meant that you needed to stop, search, search, search. And that was a crappy user experience. Um, so they very quickly went, okay, let's just make it a, a wider cone. And that was still kind of bad. So then they, I, think, I think they did a couple iterations on it until eventually it was a radius. Um, so there was some user feedback that, hey, you know what, this is still frustrating. Uh, but I think a lot of that was actually post-release feedback from the fans. Um, that's one of the reasons I really like working with Bioware, um, is that they'll look at something like that. Um, they don't feel threatened by it. They don't say, like, oh, people are just whining and complaining about a game. They're like, no. OK, they actually have a legitimate complaint. Can we fix that? Yes? Great. Patch it in. Let's make that happen. Right. Um, so you talked about. Uh how you guys did testing on the keep and how important that was for like the backstory and stuff. And then you also mentioned that there was a lot of people coming in off of like Skyrim and who hadn't played the first uh, two Dragon Days. So I'm wondering, did you guys do any sort of joint testing where you did both like had people test the keep and the gameplay? The I did. Yeah. Um, I think it was only one play test, um, and it was basically just to make sure that the functionality was there. Um, so the keep uh, is one of the things where, uh, like the players that just sat there and talked for three hours, um, you can make so many changes to the keep, like tiny, minute details that even I didn't remember were in those games. Um, so it was tough to really give people a fair use of the keep, because you can spend hours just doing that. Um, so we did test that flow, though, of, hey, OK, boot the game. OK, make your changes in the keep. Boot the game. Go in. Make sure those are there. Um, and we did that with people that didn't actually play the previous games, too, um, to make sure that that was not going to be a major hiccup. Um, and I think we succeeded. Um, although apparently there are a couple, or at least one crappy bug, I know, from people that are very reliable uh, that have not had their save changes imported. And you don't find out about that, too, uh, until pretty late in the game. Like, you've played, I think, probably a minimum of, like, six hours before you realize, oh, my gosh, I don't want to spoil what imported or what gets imported because there's way too many of you. Um, but you find out fairly later on uh, that, hey, your say changes didn't matter. And if you're a fan of the previous two games, you're really going to care that those changes didn't matter. Whoever's got the mic? Hi there. Howdy. Um, I noticed when I started up Dragon Age, I went to the tutorial, as you do, um, that something really global about the control scheme in uh, Bioware RPGs changed, and that was the auto walk. Whenever you went to wanted to talk to someone, press A, or went to pick up an item, I was wondering what the uh, what your findings were during testing for that, and what your thoughts were. Um, so I didn't actually test that specific thing. Um, so I'm into speculation land here. Um, the A button in particular was massively overloaded. Um, so the A button in the game is jump, uh, open things, and originally it was interact as well. Um, so we had like three different things on the A button. So you could be near somebody uh, that was beside a door, and you might walk up and be like, I'm going to talk to you, and open the door. Like, oh, no, I'm going to close the door. OK, now I'm going to jump. OK, now I'm talking to you. Um, so they really tried to kind of reduce the number of interactions that were possible with the button presses. Um, I, I think that kind of maybe took a little bit away from the user experience, but it also avoided a lot of frustration and problems that we saw in early testing. Um, because that door example I'm giving you, that was exactly what I saw in one of the play tests. I 
Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so some of the things that you ran into problem-wise with the player testing seemed to be knowledge that people were taking from previous games that they had played or genres. So things like spear wielders don't use fire, or mm -hmm. where is healing because I don't have a priest, or it's a mage, or something like that. Um, do, do you think that impacted, or the bear thing? That's another like bears are easy to kill and now <laughs> yeah, bears. Destroyed. Oh God, bears. Um, do you think that impacted like design features at all, or like are you guys limited in? Oh, what absolutely. You put? Um, I, I don't know if it's a problem or if it's a limitation. Um, I think kind of the key thing was messaging out to players that this works differently um, or giving them kind of a safe way to figure that out. Um, I'm going to use bears because that's funny. Um, you know, players get attacked by bears, they get destroyed. People are originally like, holy crap, okay. That was cool. And then they go back and they fight the bears and they win and they're super happy about it. So breaking that expectation can be really good. Um, and also some of the, the longer feedback we did uh, towards the end of the project, we did a three-day play test where people played for three days and then a four-day play test. Um, and people that actually got to play the game for a while started getting into areas where they started running out of potions. Um, you know, and they couldn't just sit there and heal bot their way through everything. And they're like, wow, this, was, this area was really challenging. This was really good. Um, you know, and I knew one of the contributing factors to that was that they had that resource limitation. Um, now, other players, though, had completely the opposite reaction, where it's just they just did not enjoy the game because they couldn't heal themselves, right? Um, particularly for, you know, uh, I don't mean this as a derogatory term, but Skyrim players, which are looking for more, uh, more of a kind of action RPG game, you know, or Kingdom of Amalur or Diablo or whatever, um, having that kind of tactical choice forced on you can be difficult. Um, so I think there's a really, really sensitive balancing game you need to play there. Um, I think Dragon Age got it right from the, from the feedback I got. Um, but it was definitely a risk. So you mentioned that like, basically only a quarter of players were using that tactical mode consistently. Um, and I'm not sure if that changed, so, so correct me, but uh, that seems like a lot of investment to put in a whole different control scheme and way of playing for only a quarter of players to be utilizing it consistently. So uh, when I say consistently, I mean that's like all they would do, right? So like you run into like some MOOC you're just going to blast, they would still go to that control scheme. Um, so uh, I think it was a lot of investment, um, but I, has anyone here tried to play the game on the max difficulty level? Okay, it's really, really hard. Like you just can't do it without that pause and play. Um, and Bioware deliberately created a bunch of tactical encounters. Um, you know, one of the famous ones they showed in their Twitch streams and stuff is basically there's a really good choke point for your warrior to go to. Um, and then you can kind of get up onto some stuff over here and some stuff over here and rain unholy death on your enemies. Um, if you don't have that pause and play mode, that kind of experience just doesn't work, right? Because you can't, you don't have any way of telling your companions to go up there. You don't have a way to tell your warrior to stand there with your shield and get hit in the face until I'm ready to nuke things. Um, so I think it, it definitely was an investment, um, but it also gave them a lot broader range of potential experiences they could give you. Um, and it also made sure that players weren't going to get really frustrated playing on, the, on those higher difficulty levels, or at least made that less likely. Can you speak a little bit to um, how maybe you guys play tested uh, some of the dialogue options? Uh, like, for example, is there like a, like a proportionality kind of situation that like says like, oh, this is a good option? Uh, like maybe the, maybe there's a lower bound where it's like, oh man, like nobody's choosing like yeah the crossed arm guy in this situation or over time. Right. Um, that would have been really awesome. Uh, we did none of that um, primarily because it just wasn't instrumented. Um, if we would have had that, I would have loved to dive into that data to see what people were doing. Um, one thing I can talk to uh, is, okay, spoilers that I think are, are okay. Um, you have to make a, a pretty major decision at one point in the game. Uh, you have to side with either uh, the mages or the Templars. Um, and what we found is early on, kind of the default if you just did things approach uh, was to side with the mages, okay? You would basically uh, go to a certain place. Oh, okay, I'm out of time. Um, you'd go to a certain place uh, and that would just be kind of the default uh, thing to do. Uh, and because the choice wasn't really clear, we had people show up and they were like, whoops, I accidentally sided with the mages. I didn't expect to do that. Um, so once we split those out, most people still sided with the mages. Um, but then we saw that the proportion of people that sided with Templars jump up quite a bit. So conversations we couldn't do, but at least that decision point, uh, we had the chance. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, if you did not get a chance to ask your question, please catch me at the shindig tonight. Shoot me an email, whatever. Uh, happy to talk about Dragon Age. Your only difficulty will be getting me to shut up. Thank you very much.